All right, welcome back everybody. We are going to be uh, starting blood today. So let's start with let's start with uh, something that uh, most of us can relate to. At some point in our lives, uh, you probably have to go for a blood test. And you know, one of the things to keep in mind, you know, it's may seem like a a concept that everyone probably knows. Okay, when they take blood, it's going to be spin through a centrifuge and it separates the the elements. Um, but are they drawing blood from an artery or are they drawing blood from a vein? So I'm not going to give you the answer to that. That's something that I'd like for you to uncover yourself. Um, and many of you would be like, wow, okay, now I know. All right. So the obvious may not be as obvious as you may think, but it is called venipuncture, right? Venipuncture. All right, so when the blood is spun through a uh, centrifuge, you'll see that there's a separation of things, right? You have formed elements, the heavy stuff kind of sinks to the bottom. And those formed elements are going to be like your red blood cells, your white blood cells, and your platelets or your thrombocytes. So your erythrocytes, those are your red blood cells. Your leukocytes are your white blood cells. And then your platelets are also referred to as thrombocytes, or used to be referred to as thrombocytes. And I, I kind of like that term because thrombo leads you to believe that it's involved with a thrombosis um, or clotting. So that makes up um, about 45% uh, percent or so of, of the, the blood. And then the plasma represents 55%. Now, whole blood, when we talk about blood, it's really considered to be connective tissue. It's liquid connective tissue, but nonetheless, it's connective tissue. If you think back, there was epithelial tissue, and epithelial has a bunch of cells, right, that are closely packed together on an x-ray, on a, on a microscope, right? You could see a whole bunch of cells tightly networked together like this. And th that's epithelium. Maybe it's simple squamous, uh, uh, stratified squamous, simple columnar, stratified columnar. You remember that. But connective tissue is when you have some cells and they're not so closely bound, right? But there's lots of extracellular substance between them or intercellular substance. So connective tissue is you have cells with lots of extracellular matrix and plasma is that extracellular matrix. Um, blood volume, males have about five to six liters, whereas females have somewhere between four to five liters of blood. The temperature is roughly 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The pH ranges between 7.35 and 7.45. So you're looking at an average of about 7.4. And the body, of course, has different buffering systems to kind of keep that pH within range so that you don't get this extreme alkalosis or acidosis in the body. Keeps that very tight, narrow range. Okay, so uh, blood is liquid connective tissue consisting of cells surrounded by that extracellular matrix called plasma. And I would know that blood plasma is 55% and the formed elements are 45%. In plasma, the 55% portion, you're looking at water, plasma proteins, electrolytes like sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, and then the formed elements, the red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets make up the 45%. Plasma is the extracellular matrix. It's clear, it's straw colored, and it's the um, fluid in which all the other components of the blood are gonna be suspended in. When you hear serum, serum is the plasma minus the clotting elements that are there. 
when we look at some of the plasma proteins, um, albumin is really important. You'll see albumin show up on many blood tests. Um, it helps to maintain the osmotic pressure in blood, which is that pulling force of water uh, into a system. It maintains proper pH and very important, albumin is a major, major transport protein that's found in blood. Um, there are um, globular proteins uh, like hemoglobin. Globin is a globular protein. Um, antibodies, and you know the the protein in blood is um, antibodies or immunoglobulins. And you remember um, things like IgA, IgE. So when you're looking at immunoglobulins, they'll typically be referred to as IgA's or they'll be IgE's or IgM's or IgG's. So these are specific glycoproteins that uh, are produced by the body uh, and these antibodies or immunoglobulins are going to attack foreign proteins. Certain ones are high with uh, food allergies, some antibodies or immunoglobulins spike immediately, some spike four or five days later as delayed reactions, and you'll see that many blood tests are based around creating, um, if certain antibodies are high, we can say, okay, you know, this person may be having an anaphylactic reaction, or certain uh, antibodies or immunoglobulins are high several days after consuming a food. Enzymes, these are organic proteins or catalysts that increase the rate of chemical reaction time, right? So you can think of, um, let's say, a steak. You can cook a hamburger or beef on a barbecue at 450 degrees, and it can break down those proteins and cook it in six or seven minutes at a high, high temperature. But think about our body temperature really doesn't get above like 100 degrees, right? 98 to 100 degrees for body temperature. Maybe if you spike a fever, 102, 103. So how does that break down those proteins? When we consume them, we have enzymes, right? Digestive enzymes that speed up uh, the process. Uh, fibrinogen, the OGIN tells us it's inactive that could be converted into uh, fibrin, and that's a clotting protein. Uh, the formed elements, again, red blood cells are erythrocytes, white blood cells are leukocytes, and platelets are thrombocytes. When we look at the breakdown of these, we can see that um, if we look at blood, it makes up about 8% of the body's weight. And of that 8%, now we take that blood and we know that 55% percent of it is the plasma and then the formed elements are 45 percent and that's where you have your your red blood cells and we have platelets and then we have the agranular sites like your monocyte and your lymphocyte and then we have the granular sites like your basophils and your neutrophils and your eosinophils of those formed elements, we see that platelets make up a specific portion of that. You see that there's a count there. Then there's a white blood cell count. And then there's the red blood cell count. And of that, we could see, if we look at the white blood cells, we see that neutrophils make up somewhere between 60 and 70%. And then we have lymphocytes, 20 to 25%. And then you have monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. Um, if you look at the cytoplasm, you'll see that monocytes and lymphocytes do not have granules in their cytoplasm, so they're called agranular sites. Whereas the neutrophils and eosinophils and basophils, I'll show you in a minute, do have granular, the, the cytoplasm is granular, so they're called, they're called granular sites. In terms of the percentages that they make, there's a little silly mnemonic, let's see if I can remember it, it's never let 
my engine blow. And it looks like the numbers are pretty close, but we used to say it's 60, 30, 631. 60, 30, 631, and it's pretty close in terms of the percentages. So neutrophils in the older textbooks we used to say make up 60%, and that's pretty darn close, right? 60 to 70. And then the lymphocytes make up 30%. Looks like now they're 20 to 25%. And then the monocytes used to be 6%. That's the range, 3 to 8. Eosinophils, 3%. 2 to 4, 3 is average, right? And then the basophils, about 1% and still within range. So I'm still sticking with these numbers. Never let my engine blow. 60-30, 6-3-1. Since we're on mnemonics, we might as well talk about another one. Uh, never bet Las Vegas. Um, the N is for neutrophils. And the L is for lymphocytes. So if the neutrophil count is high, it's typically seen with bacterial infections. And if the lymphocyte count is high, we're thinking there could be a viral infection. Okay, that's NBLV. Neutrophil with bacterial issues, lymphocyte with viral issues. Okay, let's look at um, some of the functions and properties of red blood cells. One of the things that we can easily point out when we look at this RBC or erythrocyte, look at the shape of that, right? It's considered to be a biconcave disc. They're anucleated, uh, meaning they don't have a nucleus. And if they did, there wouldn't be enough room for hemoglobin for the gases to bind, right? I mean, if here's the cell and you have a large structure in there called a the nucleus, there's very little room outside of it. So the RBCs are anucleated. It does not have a nucleus, so there's a lot more room in that cell for hemoglobin and for the binding of that hemoglobin to gases like oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen. So here is the RBC. You can see that the center of the RBC is a little bit lighter, right? Look at this section here. It's a little bit lighter that we call that hypochromic, chromic for color, hypo less. So we're hypochromic. And the reason being is light is going to pass through the microscope. So you could see the thinner part, which is here, light's going to pass through this a lot easier. So this section is going to appear to be lighter than this section, the periphery, which is going to be darker, hyperchromic. Okay, you're going to hear hypochromic and hyperchromic in certain types of blood pathologies as well, like with certain anemias, you may hear of things uh, hypochromic or hyperchromic. I also want you to pay attention to the diameter. Um, if you look at the diameter, this is important, <coughs> especially in terms of red blood cell recycling and the breakdown of red blood cells. Red blood cells are going to live about 120 days on average. And one of the sites that they're going to go to be recycled is not just the liver, but also the spleen. Now let's say, let's say this is the spleen. I'll just put an S there for spleen. And let's say this is a blood vessel leading into the spleen. Now if the RBC is that size, let's say this right here, is a red blood cell. Can you see that it's gonna have difficulty squeezing through a blood vessel of smaller diameter? And that's kind of neat. So when you have this larger structure here, trying to fit through that smaller structure, it bursts. And that bursting is um, essential in the recycling of the iron and the hemoglobin and the, the proteins that are there and the carbohydrates and the fats that may be in the cell membrane. So just keep that diameter in mind. So the red blood cell is anucleated. Uh, it gives more space for the hemoglobin to be in there. Uh, it's a biconcave structure, so it increases the functional surface area. It also allows for better flexibility of that to move in and out of tissues and in and out of blood vessels. And they're anaerobic, meaning 
they're not using any of the oxygen that they're carrying. So it's, it's capable of dumping 100% of that oxygen to the tissues that it needs to. And um, the kind of law or the effect that allows this um, to bind to oxygen is going to be something called the Bohr effect. So the Bohr effect, B-O-H, R, the Bohr effect is pH relevant. It's pH related. Um, when blood is driven to the lungs, deoxygenated blood, I should say, is pumped from the right ventricle into the lungs, it picks up the oxygen because of the alkalinic environment within the lungs. And hemoglobin and oxygen can bind in an alkalinic environment when that red blood cell becomes oxygenated and it's driven to the tissues and cells of the body that are looking for that oxygen, in those cells and tissues where you have the Krebs cycle, the citric acid cycle, the pH is lower. And in an acidic pH, hemoglobin releases the, iron, the oxygen and the tissues and cells can now use it for energy. So in an acidic environment, hemoglobin releases the gases, the oxygen, and in an alkalinic environment, it binds to it. So this slide here talks about the red blood cell, really should be called a red blood corpuscle because when cells don't, when they lack a nucleus, it's really not a cell, uh, it's more like a corpuscle. Um, so they're about 5 million per cubic millimeter can increase to eight million with exercise. And they're about seven to eight microns in size, a little bit larger in males because of uh, testosterone. Uh, the body makes about two million new red blood cells per minute. They live about 120 days and then they're destroyed in the spleen and liver, as I mentioned before. Uh, before they are a red blood cell, they are reticulocytes. And I'll show you what that reticulocyte looks like. It actually has a nucleus that ends up pushing it out after about a day or so. Um, if the red blood cell count increases um, or they're a lot higher in number, we call that polycythemia. Blood is going to transport uh, gases like oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitric oxide. They also transport hormones through the body and they help to disperse heat, and they help to eliminate uh, waste products. The blood is gonna regulate homeostasis, is involved in regulating balance in the body uh, by pH. We know that um, albumin is involved in regulating pH, the body temperature, and also the water content of cells. And it also helps protect us because of Antibodies, we know that there's white blood cells that are involved. Uh, so we have antibodies, immunoglobulins, but also clotting factors in blood. So it helps to protect us against any, um, you know, excessive blood loss. Nice picture here. This uh, diagram, uh, I should say, covers a lot of the uh, proteins, a lot of the constituents that are found in blood, and then it tells you what the functions are. So water makes up 91.5% of blood. It's the liquid portion of the blood. And it's the solvent, right? Water is the universal solvent. And it suspends, it's a suspension medium. And it's used for the absorption, transport, and release of heat. When we look at the plasma proteins that we mentioned early, these are the albumins, the globulins, and fibrinogen. So albumins are involved in maintaining osmotic pressure. The globulins, like immunoglobulins, these are involved in part of your immune system, protect you against viral attacks and bacterial issues. And then we have fibrinogen, which is a pretty large protein, and it's involved in blood clotting. When we think of clotting, I want you to think of uh, calcium should come into play. Calcium is involved in clotting. And I also want you to think about vitamin K, also important for blood clotting. 
electrolytes, uh, I'm sorry, the plasma proteins make up 7%. And then you have the solutes that make up 1.5. Now, just because this makes up a very small portion doesn't mean it's not very important because we can't function without electrolytes. I mean, you need sodium chloride, you need potassium chloride, calcium chloride, magnesium chloride, you need um, phosphates, we need sulfates, we need carbonic acid, bicarbonate, chloride, we need all of these things to help with our physiology. They play an essential role in the cell's function. And they also, when we talk about salts, they're involved in maintaining osmotic pressure, right? Because water always goes from where there's a lesser concentration, uh, from where there's a greater concentration to where there's a lesser concentration. That's called the osmotic pull. Um, we have nutrients, we have amino acids, we have glucose, fatty acids, glycerol, vitamins and minerals that are found. We have nitrogen, we have carbon dioxide and oxygen. We have regulatory substances like enzymes and hormones and vitamins. And then of course we have waste products. And there's a certain amount of waste products that are normal to found. I mean, there's normal levels of urea and uric acid and creatine and creatinine and bilirubin and ammonia. But when we test for these in blood, we look for abnormal amounts. So if creatine is too high or bilirubin is too high or urea is too high or ammonia is too high, these are the things that we investigate. Um, lymphocytes, uh, they're able to live for years while other blood cells can live for just hours. They can live for days or even weeks. The number of red blood cells and platelets remain rather steady while that of the white blood cells can vary depending on the invading pathogens and other foreign antigens. The process in which we produce blood cells are called hematopoiesis. All right, if we're producing red blood cells, it's erythropoiesis. Pluripotent stem cells differentiate into each of the different type of blood cells. So if we look here, you can see that we have a proerythroblast that will lead into an RBC. But before it becomes an RBC, there's the reticulocyte. And on blood tests, sometimes they'll look at the reticulocyte count. You see that it has a nucleus, but then it ejects it. After it ejects the nucleus, it then becomes the red blood cell that is anucleated. We have a megakaryoblast, which evolves into a megakaryocyte. And then this thing splits off into so many different fragments, and we call those fragments of a megakaryocyte platelets. And each of these platelets has a little bit of the nucleus. It carries a little bit of that nucleus within it. Then we have our granular sites. And those are BEN, B-E-N, basophil, eosinophil, and neutrophil. We'll talk about their structure and function in just a little bit. Very important to know that monocytes evolve into macrophages. Okay, think of monocytes as always in blood vessels. They're always in circulation. And then when they find a tissue that needs to be broken down or they need to break away debris, that monocyte leaves the blood vessels, dives into the tissues, and now becomes a macrophage, a large eating cell. And then we have lymphoid stem cells that will uh, differentiate into a T lymphoblast, which becomes your T lymphocyte, your B lymphoblast, which becomes your B lymphocyte, and then your NK lymphoblast, which becomes your natural killer cell, your NK cell. Notice that your T cells and B cells and natural killer cells come from lymphoid stem cells, whereas all the other formed cells, your RBCs, platelets, basophils, eosinophils, neutrophils, and monocytes, these come from myeloid stem cells, okay? The red blood cell erythrocyte contains that protein called hemoglobin. It's used to carry oxygen and it's used to carry nitrogen or nitric oxide and carbon dioxide. So it's there to, to, uh, to bind to gases. 
okay, and carry them to different uh, tissues. Each hemoglobin molecule contains an iron ion, which allows each molecule, molecule to bind to four oxygens. Uh, red blood cells, we said, are biconcave. So let's take a look. Here's the hemoglobin. And the hemoglobin consists of two alpha polypeptide chains, two beta polypeptide chains, and four iron atoms. The iron atom actually carries the oxygen, which is transported by the erythrocyte. And each molecule of hemoglobin A contains four irons. And each iron can carry one molecule of oxygen. Therefore, each hemoglobin A molecule that carries four mole can carry four molecules of oxygen. And the average erythrocyte contains 280 million molecules of hemoglobin. So this is some of the characteristics. You can see on the left, the biconcave disc of the RBC. You can see the surface view from the side as well as the uh, bird's eye view. You can see the hemoglobin molecule with heme and iron. And you can see the alpha polypeptide chains there. You can see Fe, that's iron. Fe is iron. The Bohr effect I already explained. We talked about how um, pH is what determines whether the red blood cell holds on to oxygen or decreases oxygen and there, um, decreases the red blood cell's ability to hold the gases or release them. The lungs are more alkalinic, so it binds to it. And at the level of the cell with all the organic acids there and lactic acid and citric acid and carbonic acid, it's, the pH is lower and it allows the oxygen to be released. Okay. Uh, Caisson's disease or uh, the bends. I just thought this was interesting to kind of add to the lecture, spark some interest. So the, the disorder occurs when a person who existed within an environment of high atmospheric pressure is rapidly depressurized. And the atmospheric gases, primarily nitrogen, which have been supersaturated within his or her blood, bubbles out of solution to form to form an air emboli. And most of the symptoms of the bends uh, results from an air emboli blocking a blood vessel that goes to certain muscles, tissues, or organs of the body. So the symptoms of bends was a lot of joint pain and musculoskeletal pain. Then there's dizziness and collapse or paralysis and even uh, stroke. And it was first um, defined when they were building the Brooklyn Bridge. The caisson is the structure that they would put an individual in to drive them down deep into the waters to start uh, building uh, the, um, I don't know if you'd call them the struts, whatever they would have to drive down deep into the ocean to stabilize the, the bridge. So the bends can be prevented by slowly decompressing individuals who have been in an environment of high atmospheric pressure by slowly decompressing them inside the chamber. Okay, this happened years ago. I'm trying to remember on the news uh, in the coal mines. Remember, there were these miners, these coal miners that got stuck. Um, I think it was in, was it Cuba? I forget where it was. And it took them days because um, each one, it would take several hours to slowly bring them up one or two members at a time, right? If they brought them up too quickly, uh, it could be could have been very detrimental uh, to their health. Um, hemoglobin is involved in regulating the blood flow and blood pressure um, by the release of NO, nitric oxide. NO comes from arginine, an amino acid, that causes vasodilation, and that can improve blood flow. And if you have dilated blood vessels, you can deliver more oxygen, more red blood cells carry hemoglobin, so you can have more oxygen, which is more energy. Uh, the red blood cells also contain carbonic anhydrase. Anything with an ACE is an enzyme. So it catalyzes the conversion of carbon dioxide and water to carbonic acid, which is used for buffering from bicarbonate to carbonic acid to bicarbonate to bi carbonic acid. Uh, carbonic acid transports about 70% of the carbon dioxide in plasma. 
So in addition to oxygen and carbon dioxide, hemoglobin carries NO or nitric oxide, and it's a major component of a substance that's called endothelial cell-derived relaxing factor. So the tunica interna, also known as the endothelial layer, they're composed of these endothelial cells that line the internal surface of arteries and veins, and they produce this endothelial cell-derived relaxing factor, which helps to relax the tunica media or the tunica musculosa, that smooth muscle layer that allows it to dilate. And when it dilates, it increases the blood flow of various organs. Okay, so the erythrocyte, the blood cell itself, can actually affect their own rate of flow by carrying NO and then affecting the blood vessel. That's pretty amazing how that happens. If there's constriction within the vessel and that muscle or that organ or the tissue is not receiving oxygen, then especially if it's, let's say, the heart, then you can get this angina, and it's called angina pectoris, which is chest pain. And that's when an individual would take a nitroglycerin, which contains high concentration of nitric oxide, which is the key ingredient in the endothelial cell-derived relaxing factor. So they use it therapeutically to treat disorders resulting from ischemia and results in hypoxia. So ischemia is when there's decreased blood flow to an area, that's ischemia. And when it's not getting its oxygen, we say they're in a state of hypoxia, less oxygen. So a particular disorder that results from tissue ischemia or hypoxia is angina pectoris. Uh, it's a cardiac disorder that's characterized by these acute or short-term episodes of crushing chest pain that is secondary to myocardial, right, the muscle of the heart, ischemia, decreased blood flow. The pain is usually accompanied by this shortness of breath. And there's usually no permanent damage to the myocardium of patients who experience angina. And there's a few different forms of angina, stable, unstable, and Prinz metals. The stable angina, this one's the most predictable, it happens after physical exertion. That's when they experience the chest pain because the heart is beating faster to pump that blood to the muscles that need it, but if there's not enough oxygen, it cramps up. No different than like a calf cramp that becomes so painful. Unstable uh, angina, um, pectoris, can occur during physical exertion or it can occur at rest. Okay, and this one has the strongest correlation to future MIs, myocardial infarctions. The Prinz metals angina, this one only happens at rest. So you don't know when that's going to happen. The average life expectancy of red blood cells is about 120 days. And think of an individual who becomes 100 or 110 years old, they become less flexible, right? Their body tissues are stiff, they're rigid, they lose their flexibilities, and so do RBCs um, after 120 days. So they need to be recycled. They need to go to the recycling bin, which is going to be the liver and the spleen, but the diameter of the blood vessels going through the spleen is about three microns, whereas the red blood cell, remember we said, was between seven and eight microns. So as it attempts to squeeze through the spleen, these blood, the red blood cells rupture. In order to increase the red blood cell lifespan, things like antioxidants, things that are against the oxidation, um, can help to increase the lifespan of RBCs. So if we look at the flow here, we'll see that if we start at one, which is here at about nine o'clock, the red blood cell dies. And then you'll see that the red blood cell is composed of heme, hemoglobin, hemoglobin. So the heme goes through one phase of recycling and the globin goes through another, okay? So the globin, which is the globular protein. Proteins are broken down into amino acids and those can be reused for protein synthesis. That's pretty cool. And then you have the heme, which has an iron containing portion and it has a non-iron containing portion. So the iron containing portion, you see the iron here is transported by transferrin. 
iron just doesn't, you know, circulate by itself. It's not safe that way, so it binds to a transport protein. And it can store that protein. It can store that, not necessarily the protein, but I mean the iron, if it's good, it can be stored in the liver. So the liver in its, the iron in its storage form is called ferritin. And that's why on blood tests, you'll see that not only are they looking at iron levels, in the blood, but it's really important to look at ferritin levels, right? It's like saying you have a lot of money in your pocket, right? If you have a lot of money in your pocket, doesn't mean that you're rich. I mean, I can have a lot of money in my pocket. Maybe all my money's in my pocket. It doesn't mean I'm rich if I don't have any in the bank. So if you have too much in your pocket, you can put some in storage. You put some in the bank, right? If you don't have enough in your pocket, you go to the bank and take it out. Same thing goes with iron. If you have iron in excess in the blood, your body can create homeostasis and balance by putting some in storage in the liver in the form of ferritin. As you run low, you can tap into that storage form, break down the ferritin into usable iron. So that's why we can look at and assess different types of anemia, like an iron deficiency anemia, by looking at functionally what's happening at the red blood cell so someone can have extreme fatigue then their iron could be low what's currently floating in their blood but then we, if their ferritin is low then we have a problem if ferritin is high and iron is low maybe they don't have the appropriate cofactors to push iron out of the liver into the blood which could be causing an anemia right sometimes you need copper to mobilize stored iron into circulation. Okay, and then you have uh, biliverdin that gets broken down and catabolized into bilirubin, right? Bilirubin goes into the liver, and then bilirubin is catabolized and broken down into urobilogen, which kind of gives urine its color and it gets catabolized further into stercobilogen, which gives feces its color and odor as well. Okay, so that's the recycling and catabolism and breakdown of red blood cells. When we need to produce more red blood cells, that's where the uh, bone, that's where the kidneys produce erythropoietin. And erythropoietin is a hormone that your kidneys can produce and it produces because remember all the blood is flowing through the kidneys and you have that region of the kidneys called the juxtaglomerular apparatus where you have the macula densa cells and the juxtaglomerular cells and they're kind of assessing like hey what's the blood pressure like and how much oxygen do we have going through here and if we don't have enough oxygen or we're in a state of hypoxia then erythropoietin is produced it goes to the red bone marrow and it pushes out more red blood cells which is erythropoiesis production of red blood cells reticulocytes as we showed you earlier these are immature red blood cells they can stay in circulation for about one day maybe two days and they push out their nucleus and they become an, an erythrocyte so here if we see that we have low levels of oxygen right we have some sort of stimulus that's creating this state of hypoxia. When we talk about hypoxia, decreased oxygen. And maybe it's due to decreased red blood cell count. Maybe it's due to decreased amount of hemoglobin. Maybe it's due to simply being in an environment where there's not enough oxygen. Nonetheless, in any of these cases, there's gonna be reduced levels of oxygen in the blood. So now the kidneys are gonna release erythropoietin. And now the erythropoietin goes to the bone marrow, to the red bone marrow, and it's going to push out more red blood cells that now have the ability of carrying more oxygen. And then what happens to the oxygen levels? They go up. Bravo, right? Restores the normal level of oxygen to the body. In order to try and balance out and stabilize red blood cells and keep them healthy and keep them living long. Erythropoiesis requires a few things. 
if you think of the uh, uh, cell membrane of it, it's made up of carbohydrates and it's made up of proteins and it's made up of fats, but we also need iron, we also need B12, we need folate in our blood, vitamin E is also very helpful, so are omega-3s or essential fatty acids, so you need essential fatty acids to help keep that cell membrane pliable and flexible. Uh, vitamin E is also very helpful to help. Let's make this vitamin E is also beneficial as an antioxidant to help to um, protect the fat soluble portion. Vitamin C helps to protect the hydrophilic portion. Uh, the body stores iron uh, in hemoglobin, about 65%, also the liver, the spleen, and the bone marrow. The intracellular iron is stored in protein iron complexes such as ferritin and hemosiderin. Hemosiderin tends to be somewhat toxic in higher concentrations, especially to the vasculature. Ferritin, not so much. And transferrin is the primary transport protein for iron, for iron transport. Let's look at a little animation here. The endocrine system regulates many body conditions with feedback loops. Each feedback loop has the following components, stimulus, a change in a body condition, Production cell, an endocrine cell that produces a hormone after being affected by stimulus. Hormone, the signaling chemical. Target cell, a cell receptive to the hormone. Action, what the cell does when affected by the hormone. Response, the overall change in controlled body condition as a result of the feedback loop. Production of erythropoietin, or EPO, is part of hormonal regulation of blood oxygen. Low blood oxygen stimulates kidney cells to secrete EPO. EPO targets precursor erythrocytes in the hemopoietic tissue and causes them to differentiate and proliferate. Increased numbers of mature red blood cells are released into the blood, increasing its oxygen carrying capacity. Blood oxygen level is restored to normal. Okay. Uh, iron toxicity, what I had mentioned before, that it can occur in individuals who have a high dietary intake of iron or when a person receives multiple transfusions. Um, when the stores of apoferritin have been saturated with iron, the body stores the iron in tissues in the form of uh, hemosiderin. And a buildup of hemosiderin can cause damage to the blood vessels and can cause cardiovascular disease. Uh, the early symptoms of iron toxicity are typically constipation and black tarry stools. Um, the, there is a genetic condition, which is called hemochromatosis or hemochromocytosis, which is when um, there is a high iron component genetically in an individual's blood. And these people have to be very, very careful with vitamin C uh, supplementation because vitamin C certainly helps to upregulate uh, iron absorption. You want to be careful with that. When we talk about iron, it just kind of brings into mind anemia because most people think of iron deficiency anemia. So I figured, hey, this is a good segue into different types of anemia. It's not just iron deficiency anemia, which is probably the most common type of anemia, but the others. Um, it's typically reduction in the production and the number of erythrocytes and a reduction in the production of uh, hemoglobin. And the most common uh, types of anemia are blood loss anemia, aplastic anemia, megaloblastic anemia, 
and uh, hemolytic anemia, such as sickle cell or thalassemia, and then the iron deficiency anemia. So blood loss is as it sounds. It's a blood loss anemia that's characterized by a reduced number of normal RBCs. Trauma, heavy menstruation, some sort of internal bleeding, like from a blood vessel that ruptures or an aneurysm or some sort of ulcer in the stomach or anywhere in the GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract. The aplastic anemia is caused by a reduction in the red bone marrow activity, um, and the reduction of the red bone marrow activity can be the result of either advanced aging or very, very commonly from chemotherapy or uh, radiation. Um, myelofibrosis, this is a um, autoimmune disease. When your body attacks your own bone marrow and turns it into scar tissues, it becomes non-functional. Megaloblastic anemia is um, typically caused by reduced dietary B12 or folate, so B9 or B12. And this is where the red blood cells generally appear larger than normal with normal to slightly reduced coloration. So they call it megaloblastic, large, mega. Slightly reduced coloration, you'll hear the term hypochromic. So the causes of the megaloblastic anemia by deficiency of uh, B12, which is pernicious anemia and or deficiency in B9. Uh, pernicious anemia is the most common form of megaloblastic anemia. It's found in people of all races, but common in individuals of Scandinavian, English, and Irish uh, ethnic extraction. Pernicious anemia is also common in Blacks and Hispanics in the US. And the underlying cause of pernicious anemia is a defect in gastric secretion of IF, which is the intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor is a glycoprotein that's produced by the parietal cells of the stomach and it's needed for the absorption of B12. So intrinsic factor and B12 bind to each other in an acidic environment. So if someone's playing around with the pH of the stomach by using some form of antacid and they raise the pH of the stomach, then B12 and intrinsic factor never bind to transport it to, the, to eventually the site of absorption, which is at that ileocecal region. Um, B12 absorption can be affected by decreased intrinsic factor if there's atrophy of the stomach lining or the gastric mucosa that typically happens as people age. If there's been uh, excision of a portion of the stomach or when the stomachs are made smaller for um, uh, weight loss. And of course, there's genetic and autoimmune factors. 90% um, of all individuals who suffer from pernicious anemia demonstrate parietal autoantibodies in their serum. Chronic gastritis that can be caused by alcohol ingestion and uh, any type of gastric atrophy uh, can lead to pernicious anemia. So here you'll see that the um, characteristics, megaloblastic anemia is characterized by large normal colored red blood cells. Um, so they can be macrocytic, large, and normochromic to hypochromic, so normal color to hypo to less color. There's a decrease in hematocrit. So besides RBC they'll also and hemoglobin, they'll also look at hematocrit levels in the blood and mean corpuscular volume. Pernicious anemia develops slowly and it is usually severe by the time it's uh, sought out and, and treated. The symptoms could be vague. There could be increased susceptibility to infections, mood swings, GI issues, cardiac issues, kidney issues. On the left, you see the larger RBCs, and on the right-hand side, you see normal RBCs. You can see they're a lot larger on the left than they are on the right. The hemolytic anemia is the two most common are sickle cell and thalassemia, either Cooley's anemia or Mediterranean. Um, thalassemia kind of, it means like a, anemia by the sea. Uh, by the Mediterranean. A genetic defect in a gene that codes for the production of beta polypeptide chain in hemoglobin A. Now it's a problem in the primary structure at the number six position in the polypeptide chain where valine is substituted for glutamic acid 
causing a hemoglobin to decrease the amount of oxygen to the cell. So the cell becomes sickle shaped, which is what you see on the left. You can see a normal one and you can see one that's crenated. Crenation typically happens when water is pulled out of that cell. Here's another sickle shaped and you can see that the exchange happens at that number six position. right here. So it can create what's called a sickle cell crisis, especially in the spleen, where you get those cells that cluster up and the blood vessels become blocked. So you get this vaso-occlusive crisis. Um, there's a sequestration crisis where blood pools or collects in any given area, or there could be a hyper- hemolytic breaking, which is hemolytic lysis where the blood, the blood cells just break down. The evolution, biology of sickle cell anemia. So sickle cell was or is the body's way of fighting off the disease malaria. And the side effect, the crisis occurs to the body and the sickle cell uh, can cause death. So the agent that causes malaria is plasmodium falciparum and it lives and hides inside a red blood cell to proliferate. And the treatment for children born with sickle cell could be to remove the spleen where they are produced and they call the spleenectomy or they remove, you know, they, they, they remove the entire organ, which is the ectomy portion. The thalassemia is a genetic blood disorder that affects a uh, person's ability to produce hemoglobin and this thalassemia type A and thalassemia type B, you don't need to know uh, the differences there, but it means anemia by the C and thalassemia is genetic. Iron deficiency anemia is characterized by small, normochromic to slightly hypochromic uh, red blood cells. And it's often caused by the inability to absorb dietary iron. And when you do an NPE, a nutritional physical exam on an individual, and we'll teach you how to do that, um, it's, there are some signs that you can look at from head to toe. Um, I always like to shake an individual's hand whenever I greet any of my patients. I turn it over and they don't even know that I started the exam from the hello, but I'm testing the strength of the hand, which is a lot, telling me a lot about amino acids and proteins and how their body um, uses it to build up those tissues. I'm looking at the nails and in this case, you can see whitening of the nails. That's from hypoxia, right? When there's erythemia, like erythrocyte erythemia, um, when it has that, help, when the nail body is pink and red, now we know that oxygen's getting there. When they turn whitish or bluish, then there's decreased oxygen that's getting there. You can also pull down the eye and we can look at the palpable brim, which is in here. And you can see that this all looks white and pale, another sign of anemia. Also, um, a pulse oximeter. If oxygen is getting down to the fingertip, then the oxygen saturation is going to be, you know, 97 or, or greater. The highest it can be is 100%. So another great tool uh, that can be used to assess. And then this is the pulse rate, 72 normal. Okay, let's look at the white blood cells, uh, leukocytes. They contain a nucleus and organelles, but no hemoglobin. Only the RBC has hemoglobin. And white blood cells can be uh, categorized, as I mentioned earlier, as either granular or the second classification is agranular by their structure. Mm -hmm. If the cytoplasm has these vesicles that can be stained then they're granular. If they don't, then they're A, which means without, agranular. The granular ones, I call them Ben, basophil, eosinophil, and neutrophil. And the agranular sites are L and M, lymphocyte, and monocyte. And there are some unique characteristics to each. Um, oh, here was just a picture of the iron deficiency anemia. The slide was a little bit out of order, but you can see on the left-hand side, hypochromic, right? 
and then normal on the right-hand side. You could see the less density in the center of the RBC on the left. Okay, the white blood cells here. Um, let me just activate the pen again. Let me make this um, blue. Okay, so we have the basophil, eosinophil, and neutrophil. So these three are granular. And the granules are these. You can see them. You can see in the cytoplasm, there's a grainy appearance. And you don't see those type of granules here in a monocyte, and you don't see them here in the lymphocyte. So these two, I'll put an A, G for A granular. And these three are granular. The granulations degranulate when there's a pathogen or a problem, and it just is there to help defend and destroy and kick some major butt, okay, whatever that pathogen is. So the neutrophils, these are uh, mature circulating phagocytes. They represent about 60% of the total number of circulating white blood cells. Remember, never let my engine blow, 60, 30, 631. It's the most common uh, white blood cell. The function is it's the first, it's the, the white blood cell that arrives first when there's an issue. Okay, it arrives there first, it arrives there quicker, even faster than a monocyte. And the neutrophils are going to degranulate and they're going to release their hydrolytic, proteolytic um, enzymes to help to disintegrate whatever pathogen was there. That's what these neutrophils are going to do. And under a microscope, the neutrophil has an interesting characteristic where it's going to have somewhere to three to five lobes of the nucleus. So this one has one, two, three different lobes to the nucleus. And you could see that there are granules. These are all granulations in the cytoplasm. Eosinophils. Um, these are used to be called acidophils, and I used to like when they were referred to as acidophils because it tells us the fill tells us that it likes something and it likes an acidic stain, whereas the basophil likes a basic stain. So when the acidophil stains, the granules turn red, okay? They make up about 3% of the total circulating white blood cells. And eosinophils are typically going to be high with allergies and parasites, and they're going to be designed to kind of counteract what the basophils are producing, which is lots of histamine and uh, heparin. So the function is that it's going to secrete histamine ACE to try and downregulate that histamine reaction. So they are ingesting that antibody antigen complex in allergies. So when there's allergies, we're going to see eosinophils, the eosinophil count to be quite high. Now eosinophils, these are bilobed, bilobed. So there's one lobe here and one lobe here, and the granules stain red. The basophils, the being in basophils, I think blue, black, I think dark staining. Um, the basophils make up a much smaller percentage. The nucleus looks like an S. If you can see it, it looks somewhat S-shaped, but it's kind of blocked by the dark staining granules. So basophil likes the dark blue staining um, dye. Um, they produce heparin, which is an anticoagulant. It thins the blood. Histamine, which dilates the blood vessels, and then also serotonin as well. Here is a dark staining um, white blood cell. That's the basophil. When you really can't make out what the nucleus looks like and you see dark staining granules, that's going to be the basophil. White blood cells may live for several months or years, and their main function is to combat any type of invading uh, microbe. And during the invasion, the white blood cells are able to leave the bloodstream and collect at the site of the invasion. And the process is called emigration or diapedesis. And when you look at that, the different steps of diapedesis, you'll see that blood is flowing. And then something happens where it starts to, you can see the emigration process where it rolls 
and then sticks and then it squeezes through the tight junctions. So it starts to roll against the wall, that endothelial layer becomes very sticky and then it moves in to where the damaged tissues are. Uh, this is an important concept. I want you to keep this in mind because what ends up happening in many cases is when cholesterol levels go up and they get oxidized, the oxidized cholesterol moves inward in this direction. So if this is a cell, and I'll put an X there for oxidized, now you're going to have white blood cells as well, as you can see here, squeezing between the cells and monocytes as well squeeze between here. And once the monocyte leaves circulation, this monocyte is going to move into like a Pac-Man, right? It's going to move in this direction. It's going to engulf the oxidized LDL cholesterol. And now this becomes a foam cell. I'll put an F there for foam cell. Specific monocyte that became a macrophage that engulfed the damaged cholesterol. And then this starts to pool up on this side of the blood vessel. Unlike what most people think, that cholesterol builds up on this side, it doesn't. It builds up here. And it creates this indentation into the lumen. They call it a lipid pool. So now this cholesterol starts to build up here and it pushes in, right? It pushes into the blood vessel. So now as blood is moving in this direction, the blood pressure in this area, the space remaining builds up and blood becomes turbulent. The body thinks you got shot or stabbed there and it clots it up. So in general, an elevation in white blood count usually can indicate an infection. We know that neutrophils are correlated with bacterial issues and lymphocytes with viral issues. A low white blood cell count may develop due to several causes. And a differential of white blood cell count will help to determine uh, what the problem is. That's when they do a differential. So here, very, very nice slide because it tells us what they indicate, right? So if you do um, a CBC, a complete blood count with a differential, well, maybe the neutrophil count is high or maybe it's low. So if it's high, we know that it's seen high with bacterial issues or burns or inflammation. And if it's low, well, maybe there was some radiation exposure. Maybe there's drug toxicity. Maybe there's a vitamin B issue or some autoimmunity like SLE, systemic lupus erythematous, SLE. Let's look at the eosinophils. Let's do the granular sites first. So we did the neutrophil. Let's look at the eosinophil. You can see that it's by load. We see the red staining granules, allergies and parasitic infections, also some autoimmune diseases. And if it's low, drug toxicity, acute allergic reactions. So when there's allergies, E, allergy, eosinophils. When the basophils are uh, low, pregnancy, ovulation, or hypoactive thyroids. When it's high, allergic reactions, once again, because they're creating the histamine, whereas the eosinophil is producing the histamine ACE. So that's why both of these are high with allergies. Okay, also basophils are high with leukemias and hypothyroidism. Now the monocytes, monocytes are high with viral or fungal issues, um, also can be high with TB, leukemias, and low if the bone marrow is suppressed. Also treatment with cortisol. People get cortisone shots, shots, cortisol, prednisone, they can all uh, decrease the monocytes and the immune system becomes uh, weaker. The lymphocytes can become high if there's a viral infection or infectious mono and leukemias and low if there's a prolonged illness. If there's immunosuppression or if someone's on immunosuppressants like cortisol being one of them. Okay. Lymphocytes, these are um, cells that have a large nucleus, typically takes up the same amount of space as the, as the cell itself. They're agranular, and there's B and T cells. 
the E for the bone marrow, T for thymus. Um, the lymphocyte represents about 30% of all the circulating white blood cells. Never let my engine blow, 60-30, 6-3-1. There's the lymphocyte. You can see that the nucleus here is almost as large as the cell. Again, the B lymphocytes, these come from bone marrow. And B lymphocytes, it's really important to know that they evolve into plasma cells. And then plasma cells produce antibodies, like those immunoglobulins, IgG, IgA, IgM, IgGs. So they're involved with antibody or humoral-mediated immunity. Your T cells are produced by the thymus gland, and they're phagocytic. And the T lymphocytes provide us with cellular mediated immunity. When you talk about B cells, we're talking about humoral mediated immunity. T cells are cellular mediated immunity. These are your T4 cells and T8 cells. T4 cells help T8 cells destroy invaders. And T4 cells decrease in things like acquired immune deficiency syndrome. NK are natural killer cells. These are another type of lymphocyte. They don't fit into B cells or the T cells, but natural killer cells attack a wide variety of microbial pathogens. Uh, monocytes, these are always circulating phagocytes, and then they move into the tissues that are damaged and they become macrophages. And these macrophages can change their names. If they're in the brain, they're called microglial cells. If they're in the liver, they're called Kupfer cells. If they're in the spleen, splenic macrophages. In the lung, uh, alveolar dust cells or alveolar macrophages. And you can see that the kidney, the uh, nucleus looks a little bit more kidney bean shaped here. Those are monocytes. Uh, megakaryocytes uh, in the red bone marrow splinter into two to 3,000 fragments to create platelets or thrombocytes. Um, the platelets are used to clot the blood and they contain many vesicles but no uh, nucleus. Okay. Um, let's see what else here. The platelets are under the influence of the hormone thrombopoietin. Kind of looks like erythropoietin. Um, and platelets can survive for only five uh, to nine days. Okay, the neutrophils, eosinophils, and the basophils, again, when we look at uh, their structure and their function, and we look at some of their characteristics, you can see that up on top, the red blood cell, seven to eight micrometers in diameter, they're biconcave, there are no nuclei, they live for 120 days. And then we know what happens after 120 days, right? You can review that slide of what happens to an RBC and what it's broken down to. Uh, the function is to store hemoglobin so that hemoglobin can bind and transport those gases, carbon dioxide, oxygen, and nitrogen oxide. The white blood cells, the neutrophils, the eosinophils, and the basophils, these are the granular white blood cells. We know that the neutrophils destroy bacteria. They kind of release these strong enzymes to break down the pathogen. You can see they release these lysozymes, defensins, strong oxidants, such as superoxide anion, hydrogen peroxide. These are all going to help protect the body. Eosinophils, they combat the effect of histamine by releasing histamine ACE. They're involved in parasitic issues. They try and destroy the parasites. And then basophils, they're going to liberate heparin and histamine and even serotonin. Also seen in many inflammatory issues and allergies. The A granular were the uh, T cells, I'm sorry, the um, lymphocytes, which are T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. Again, if you look at that top one, you can see that the nucleus is almost as big as the cell, and then the monocyte has the kidney bean shaped nucleus. And then platelets right down here, very small. 
The platelets, um, they contain vesicles, but no nucleus. So I think I'm just going back in my mind. I think in that one of the earlier slides, um, so I want to stand corrected, in one of the earlier slides when I showed the, um, the evolution of blood cells, and then it showed that megakaryoblast that kind of broke down. Um, I think I said that each platelet has a nucleus, so they do not. They do not have nucleuses. Uh, the platelets are involved in um, clotting. So there's vac vascular spasms and blood clotting that take place. And I said, I want you to think about, when I think of clotting, I'm thinking of key terms like uh, calcium. Um, I'm thinking about vitamin K. I'm thinking about fibrin, fibrinogen, prothrombin. And these things can also be tested on blood tests where you can actually check the prothrombin time and fibrinogen levels and INR. All of these can be tested for um, how the body can clot itself. Uh, bone marrow transplants are preferred to replace cancerous red bone marrow with normal red bone, bone marrow. And the donor is usually collected from the top of the hip bone, the iliac crest. Uh, stem cells are collected and frozen from an umbilical cord after birth, and that also can be used, and it can have as advantages over the bone marrow transplants. Uh, the stem cell collection from the umbilical cord is non-painful. Um, the, the iliac crest, um, you know, biopsy or, or doing that transplant can be somewhat uncomfortable. Uh, hemostasis is a sequence of responses that stop bleeding, and the process involves vascular spasms, platelet plug formation, and blood clotting. This is quite common when there's um, damage that's happening, especially in the blood vessels of the neck, people can typically experience not only bad, bad headaches, but stiff, tight necks. And that could be because there's some spasms and vascular spasms around the blood vessels in the neck. And um, this could be the beginning of the process of um, vascular uh, weakening in the neck. And you can see that there's a platelet plug that can form in these different steps where there's platelet adhesion in step one, there's the platelet release reaction where it liberates uh, thromboxane A2, and then there's platelet aggregation where they cluster together to help to, to clot. It shows what happens in the early stage, intermediate stage, and you could see the fibrin kind of laying itself down creates this mesh-like network to create uh, clotting. So blood clotting involves separate and several uh, coagulation steps and factors. I'm not going to ask you to memorize all of the steps. It really isn't important, but I want you to be familiar that there's an extrinsic pathway and an intrinsic pathway, both of which are going to lead to the same end result. Um, both of the pathways lead to the formation of prothrombinase, and from there, the common pathway continues. So you can see on the left, there's an extrinsic um, pathway, some sort of tissue trauma that takes place. And then on the right, there's an intrinsic pathway. There's some damage to the uh, blood vessel uh, lining internally there. But the key steps or some of the key things that I want you to see that's involved, we have calcium that's involved in clotting. You see calcium at many steps. Then you see prothrombin to help produce thrombin. But again, calcium is involved as a cofactor to make the conversion of prothrombin into thrombin. And then calcium again is needed to convert thrombin into fibrinogen, right? And then fibrinogen has to be activated into fibrin for the clotting. Also, vitamin K is also needed, K for coagulation. So you can see that some of the clotting factors that are involved here, you have fibrinogen, the source, the liver produces it, prothrombin, again, the liver produces it, calcium, it comes from the diet, it comes from the bones, comes from platelets. 
Then we have Christmas factor, interesting name, also produced by the liver. And this just tells you if it's the intrinsic pathway or, you know, extrinsic and intrinsic pathway that it's used. Okay. Once the clot forms, it retracts or tightens to pull the edges of the damaged vessel together. And again, vitamin K is needed for normal clot to form because it's used in the synthesis of four clotting factors. And again, um, you don't have to memorize what the four clotting factors are. And then the small unwanted clots are usually dissolved by plasmin, which is an enzyme that's part of the fibrinolytic system, right? There's the word lysis to break down. To break down what? Fibrin. What is fibrin? A clotting protein. So plasmin is involved. Um, blood is characterized in different blood groups. You guys are familiar with this. Are you a blood type A, AB, or an O? And then um, are you A positive? Are you AB positive? That's based on whether RH is present or not. And it's present in about 85% of the uh, population. So you can see here uh, blood type um, percentages, what percentage of the European American population is a blood type O or blood type A. Uh, blood plasma usually contains antibodies that can react with A or B antigen. So if I'm a type A blood type, I'm going to have a blood type A antigen sticking out on my cell membrane as a cell identity marker telling the world and telling my body that I'm a type A. So if there's any other invasion of blood that enters my body, my body will produce antibodies to attack that other type of blood and destroy it. Okay? An individual will not have a glutens against his or her own blood type, and that would be, you know, self-destructive. So you can see that a type A blood on the left, the top left, a type A blood is going to have a type A antigen on it. So that means that in my plasma, I'm going to have an anti-B antibody. So that if I'm accidentally given a blood type B, my body will produce antibodies against it. I don't want it creating antibodies against my own type. Now, if I'm a type B, then I have a B antigen sticking out on that. And my body will have a different type of antibody, an anti-A antibody so that if this person is given a blood type A, it will attack it and destroy. Now, if I'm an AB and I have an AB antigen on my surface, I can't have either, right? Because if I'm given A or B, I don't want it to attack. I may need that. But if I'm neither, if I'm a blood type O and I neither have an A nor a B antigen, I'm going to have both anti-A and anti-B antibodies. Okay, so here, if I'm a blood type A, whoop, let me go back to that. If I'm a blood type A, then I have an A antigen. If I'm a blood type B, I have a B antigen. If I'm a blood type A, then I'm going to have antibodies against B. Okay, who is the compatible donor, an A or an O? Who is incompatible? Well, whatever's left, the B and the AB. Okay, you can apply that concept to the other blood types. Uh, typing and cross-matching are performed in order to determine a person's blood type. A drop of blood is mixed with an anti-serum that will agglutinate the blood cells that possess the agglutinogens that react with it. So that if I am a type A, how do I figure that out? So if I'm a blood type A and I'm treating with an anti-A serum, it's going to agglutinate. And that confirms that I'm a type A blood. If I treat it with an anti-B, nothing's going to happen. It's not going to recognize it. And this is how we determine what type of blood type an individual is, right? At birth, small amounts of the fetal blood leak into the maternal circulation. Okay, this is the hemolytic disease of the newborn. If the baby is RH positive, right, RH positive, and the mother's RH negative, she'll develop antibodies to the RH factor. This is not a problem for baby number one. 
But during the next pregnancy with an RH positive baby, when she transfers the antibodies to the fetus, which is a normal occurrence, the transferred anti-RH antibodies will attack some of the fetus red blood cells causing agglutination and hemolysis. So here on the left, the mom is RH negative, the first baby is RH positive. And when she delivers, there's gonna be this exchange of blood that goes on and now the mom creates these RH positive antigens, okay? And I'm sorry, the, the baby is now, when the baby is delivered and there's this exchange of from the RH negative mother and the RH positive baby, there's going to be RH positive antigens that are produced in which the mother is going to produce antibodies against that. And that's what these are. Now, if the mother gets pregnant a second time, that's when these antibodies are now going to attack the baby and destroy the red blood cells. So what ends up happening is mom, if they know she's planning a pregnancy, they will inject mom with Rogam. And Rogam is the decoy that then fills these antibodies and blocks it so it doesn't attack the baby. Okay? And I think that was the last slide. Let's just make sure we covered all of them. And we did. Great. So we hope you enjoyed that.